This Rev3 Games interview is brought to you by Audible. I'm happy to be joined by Dan Greenwald. Obviously, Forza, and uh, I just finished playing it. Uh, okay, so much was made about the drive at heart mm -hmm. term. Um, you know, I, I think there was some suspicion if it was just sort of a marketing term. Having played this, I really did see something different. Um, let, let's, let's just start with that. What, it, it's taking other people's skills from the cloud and putting it into the AI of the cars that you're driving against? Yeah, it, so unfortunately, um, gamers have mis, been besieged with a lot of talk of revolution and this and that. And so I don't want to use the term. What I'll say is, we've explained it several times and I'll explain it again, but the proof is in the pudding. When you race the game, you will see the AI do things that you've only seen humans do in the past. And as you turn the difficulty up, you will see the profile of the driver become like professionals, where they, they'll cut little corners and they, I mean, it's incredible the precision they'll apply. And again, they're doing it on a simulation that we're doing things in the simulation that weren't possible last generation. This is a very complex simulation, and the AI are able to drive this like a human. So, I've had the AI double fake me, they've baited me into mistakes, I see them battling up in front of me. And technologically what this is, is a Bayesian learning network. It's, it's learning in the cloud. Every time you race, I race, anybody races, we upload a small amount of telemetry. It's a lot of data, it's just a small number of, of uh, kilobytes. Mm -hmm. And the cloud draws correlations and generalizations and learns new behavior. And the way it's doing that is, um, let's imagine that uh, you were heading into the corkscrew and there's a, guy, there's a car behind you and you tap the brakes. The AI doesn't need to know that you were check braking that guy. It just needs to know corkscrew, front wheel drive car, there's a guy behind you. Got it. And it looks at the general population and says, hey, you know, I've noticed that 6% uh, of the population does that. I should learn how to do that. Then it learns how to do it. And then when your drive guitar, let's say you do that, it's gonna say, oh, let's teach his drive guitar to do that. That's something he seems to do. So the population of drive guitars learns new skills and your drive guitar learns new skills. And as you get better, it forgets your old way of driving. And as you do more races on Laguna or Alps or something, it learns more about that. Rear wheel drive, front wheel drive, the, the way you race, your aggression level. So it's always evolving across multiple dimensions. So basically the system is, is learning at a macro level and it's learning at an individual level and it's uploading a small amount and downloading a small amount of data in between races. You can play it offline. It's gonna basically have cache data from the last time it connected the servers and downloaded stuff. We have over seven, or we have seven difficulty profiles for the drive guitars. And the best way to think about that is a population of the world that's driving. When you go to Unbeatable, you're racing against the drive guitars of our fastest lap time racers in the world. But again, it's not replays and ghosts. Right, that's They're what real okay. AI, and that's where people have struggled. They, you know, I've got, I've been asked a lot, like, uh, oh, so it's like ghosts. I'm like, no, it's actually nothing like ghosts. It, it's learning AI. Oh, so it's like AI in other games. I'm like, well, yeah, but watch it. It, it doesn't race like AI in other games unless you've seen other games. We've done things with scripting, you know, where it does this, it does that. This isn't scripted. It learns something, and it's evolving every day. Um, one of the things that that was striking to me is, of course, I was seeing. <laughs> other drive guitars that were driving better than I, um, but there were moments of flaws. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, and, and, and the way that I was, you know, would crash into other cars, I guess when I tend to drive in a lot of other games, if I uh, hit another car, I assume it's my own failing. Here, I felt that there was, you know, that same level of aggression and sometimes mistakes that was causing collisions or cutting corners, getting a little bit off the track. It was, mm -hmm. it was just something I don't feel like I've actually seen in, in another racing game. It's, uh, it's been cool as a creator to watch it because there was the vision and what we wanted to create. And there's the technology, which is what we worked on. But now there's the experience. And the experience is really what it's all about. Getting racing that has true racecraft and has true personality. The, the vision we had behind this is we wanted a system that made every pass you make feel like its own race. That you had to catch them, you had to figure out what their weakness was, and you had to pass them. And you could try and do that with brutality and you know, ram them off the track. Uh, or you could try and set them up, and they might set you up. Mm -hmm. And this uses the 16-car race much more effectively. So it's not like you're trying to just get into first place and hold on to first place and get bored, which is what I found in most racing mm -hmm. games, including Forza 4, right? You smash through a bunch of cars till you get in first, and once you're in first, you almost regret being there. Because all of a sudden you're just hot lapping and you wish there was more competition. 
Now you've got opponents that are reacting, doing their own thing, and you pass one guy and now it's the next guy. And we've changed it so you're no longer trying to come in first, you're trying to podium. And the reason is, shit happens in racing. It happens now in our AI. It doesn't usually happen in single player and other games. And so you can't count on coming in first place because somebody might collect you on a corner. You just don't know. And now you're going to battle back. So we have all these assists, you know, um, turn the driving assists off. You can make the AI profile harder. And those are going to give you a lot more scalers on your money. Don't use rewind. And, you know, if you use rewind, we're going to take some of your money away. All of this is meant to get people to have a risk reward every you know, second of that race that they're thinking, you know, I should turn that difficulty up a little bit. I'll make more money and I won't worry about coming in first. I just have to come in third. It really changes the racing. Well, it, it, in addition to that, like the silver trophy mm -hmm. would be fourth through seventh, I believe. Yeah. In the placing there. And what that seemed to do is, okay, maybe I don't think I'm ever going to make it to first place, but I'm still going to get some money if I get, if, if, if I get the silver. And so you're now racing in the middle of the race. You're, you're not trying to be in that very top group because you have to be first, second, or third if you're going to progress. It, it, was, it was interesting how I began to sort of hone in on where my benefit would be you know, in, in this get, given race. And I wasn't hitting start and just restart every single time. You know, it's a very astute observation, honestly. No one's mentioned it yet. And it was something that was very important to us is that racing for too long has been too binary. There's first place and then there's a whole bunch of losers. And that's- As with game review scores. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess there's some truth in that. Uh, our goal was to say every pass is a race and then every group of those uh, tiers, you know, bronze tier, silver tier, gold tier, is its own race. So that you're always in a small race, a medium sized race, and then the overall race. And you're always challenged with the difficulty and how you set those settings so that we can make a game that has the depth of a cutting edge simulation on the tires and what have you. But you find where you fit and you play it how you want to play it. And the game's not telling you throw your old cars away or play like this. The game's saying, hey, I see how you're doing. That's great. Keep doing that. That's awesome. Did you have fun? Good. <laughs> keep having fun because that's why we play games. Um, so how do you sort of keep the player engaged? I mean, it, I've, I've always tried to figure out, you guys are so good with like, hey, I want to do one more race, I want to do one more race. But there is that sense, I'll, I'll earn enough money, I'll get a new car. How is it set up that, that, that you're getting that kind of core satisfaction out of a racing game, which is a new automobile? There are big changes in this game, um, but they're not big in, their, in each step. Each change is small, but they add up to a big difference in the experience. We no longer gift cars at player levels, for example, which sounds like a small change. But it's a big change in that most people would um, use their gift cards and would then not use their money. They, they wouldn't buy cars necessarily, especially if they don't really know cars, so they don't have that driving passion to go get a car. So we removed gifting cars and we now gift more money. And then when you start a race, uh, sorry, a series, so you're starting a career basically, the Top Gear guys come in, all three of the presenters, and they tell you something funny about the cars and kind of get you in the mood. And then we present you with the cars that work for that event. And you buy the car at that point, which makes just more logical sense. Not that we gift you a car and then you go find something to do with it, but instead you go to the area you want to play in and you buy the car then. Well, at that moment, we auto upgrade the car to be at the top of its class so it's competitive with all the other cars in that group. But if you don't want to do that, you can go upgrade it yourself. We've got the incredibly deep upgrade area. You can tune it, change the tire pressure, the suspension, uh, all of that. All of this is meant to be, if you're not a real depth sim player, hit A, 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 A. And it's a very logical progression where you're getting exposed to cars and humor with Top Gear. But if you are a more deep player, you just jump off the path for a second. You go upgrade yourself. You go save up the money you wanted for this Ferrari or that old Ford RS200 or whichever car you, you're really into, and you can play it either way. Um, so one thing I did also notice, it looks like that uh, if, 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 if you're short on time but you're, but you're high on desire, mm -hmm. um, that you'll be able to do some microtransactions, or maybe not micro, transactions to kind of buy yourself some credit so you can kind of jump ahead and buy another car. That, mm -hmm. that, that kind of stuff, has always been taken kind of with, with some apprehension, I think, by some of the core gaming community. Is this yeah. something that, that you've thought about for a while? And how have you implemented it that it feels like it's, it's, it's not throwing the game out of balance? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, honestly, we're not, a, we're not a freemium game. We're a premium game. And so you're getting 200 cars, and our economy gives you a lot of money, and you turn up those scalers, and you can really earn money fast if you're a, a skilled player. And if you're not a skilled player, you still earn money really well. Well, we found in Forza 4 and in, uh, in Horizon 
was the tokens were there. Mm -hmm. Because we serve such a diverse group of people, we have guys that are simulation gamers that they don't they couldn't be bothered with our whole economy unlocking whatever they know what they wanted they know they want to get in on spa with a grand prix car and that's what they want to do and so the tokens are there to say look if that's what you want to do do it but the game is not ever limiting you we give you a lot of money and again just turn up the difficulty you'll earn even more so we don't see it as a uh, a microtransaction thing we see it as a true accelerator not a there's a wall in your way but rather oh you want to jump somewhere you know basically jump to another world that's your choice. Go ahead and do it. And then also, we actually start you off with 100 tokens. So even from the beginning, we actually just give them to you. Um, what is the appeal of cars? I mean, I was, I was thinking, like, you know, it, you've called it car porn since I saw you demo the very first Ford for me, yeah. and there's something very accurate about that. But I was, I was thinking when I was playing it that, you know, I don't think you could pull that off with planes. I don't think, I don't think you could mm. even pull that off with guns in, obviously, many of the shooters out there. But there is... Yeah. This innate allure and fantasy of a real-world object that you know you guys and obviously other racing titles mm -hmm. as well seem to tap into. And I was curious your thoughts as to what is it about this one object in life that that has yeah. such allure? I, you know, obviously it's I'm, it's pure conjecture, so take it for what it oh, is, yeah. right? Uh, what's interesting to me is that cars are a big purchase for most people, all people, frankly. It's a big purchase, and they speak about who you are. Even when you're saying it doesn't, it does. Usually people are choosing a car that either says I don't care, it's like clothes, right? Yeah, we, yeah. I deliberately am saying I don't care about how I look. Yes. But you're deliberately <laughs> doing it. You're making a <laughs> right? statement nonetheless. Um, <laughs> or you're deliberately saying that you've got a lot of money or you like fast things or you like slow things or quirky things or whatever. So it's a bit of a fashion side uh, to cars. Very expensive fashion. Very. You can't, it's not, you know, it's not a pair of uh, twenty-five dollar jeans <laughs> at the lowest end. You're, you're talking about a five thousand dollar purchase, um, and the highest end is ridiculous. So I think there's that aspect, but also as a designer myself, I really appreciate the form and the function and the balance that that has with different cars. You you look at an Audi R18 race car, and it's beautiful, but it was designed for speed. It was not designed to look beautiful. It was designed in a wind tunnel and by scientists, and it was designed with and, and uh, a lack of passion, in a sense, for, for the aesthetic. And then you look at a car like a, uh, boy, some of the Alfa Romeos that are mm. just flamboyant and beautiful, or, or, uh, or a Abarth uh, 500, the Mini. Um, these are, are very flamboyant, cool cars. And so you get that balance. You can find, you know, what speaks to you. I don't know, I, I think there's the technology, there's the, there's the memories. You think about the first car you ever owned, you know, people have poignant memories about that. Uh, sometimes the first accident you got in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think cars are part of our life and they're multifaceted because it's fashion, because it's memories, because it's technology, because it's design. Um, that uh, different people are passionate for different reasons, but all together it has a big impact on our overall psyche. Well, um, I, I, I will explore this uh, this issue further, obviously, when the game comes out, and that's uh, November 22nd it is. on Xbox One. Dan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Enjoying our interviews and you want to support Rev3 Games? Then why not try out Audible? Audible has over 100,000 audiobooks and spoken word entertainment in every genre that can be played back anywhere, anytime. You can get a free audiobook when you go to audiblepodcast.com slash Rev3Games, and best of all, Every sign-up helps support the show.